G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for another edition of the Eagles Corner to discuss all things West Coast Eagles. Obviously, we're in that little awkward period between the trade period ending and the draft happening. Uh, so naturally, I haven't had a reason to come up with an Eagles Corner video, but there is some pretty big news. In fact, as far as personal changes, a new CEO at the West Coast Eagles is pretty damn significant. So we'll discuss that to, to some extent, uh, perhaps a little look at the, at the upcoming draft as well. And there has also been some... Uh, uh, list management changes or, or moves at least to re-sign a few rookies. So we'll just catch up on everything that's happened at West Coast in the last few weeks. So first of all, we've got a new CEO, Trevor Nisbet steps down as, uh, despite having one year to go on a contract, I believe. He was contracted to the end of 2024 and most of the communication we'd heard really about Nisbet uh, and from Nisbet was that uh, 2024 was going to be his final year. He had agreed with the board uh, not to extend that contract past that year, but here we are, still in 2023, and Don Pike has stepped into the role, although he will have to wait until January 15th. I think that is the official handover day. So it's kind of interesting the way this has actually happened in the sense that uh, it did appear that, you know, Nisbet was going to be here for at least one more year. If I'm not mistaken, there was an article a few weeks ago suggesting that Don Pike was not going to be in the race for the CEO position, and that has subsequently obviously changed. Um, if I had to guess what happened there is that Don Pike was looking for a role here and now and unwilling to stay, you know, twiddling his thumbs for 12 months. And so, you know, Nisbet's walked out and uh, in, I would argue we've probably selected probably the best man for the job that was possibly going to emerge. Just touching on Nisbet himself, you know, obviously the CEO of a big club like West Coast, it's pretty difficult to, from an outsider's perspective to really try and appraise how how well he did or whether we really needed a change. You could certainly make some broad comments about the fact that we kind of may perhaps been a little bit of an insular organization over the last few years. You know, the same CEO for 25 years, um, you know, that's that's pretty unheard of in our game. And so, you know, with the, the club in general, in the state that it's in, um, you know, from the AFL men's competition, the horrendous state of the waffle team, uh, the reserve side in the waffle competition, and then, you know, the AFLW team, becoming second last again in those metrics you know on field success uh, this has been this is the lowest point of the club so there's an argument we made change change needed to happen obviously they're backed in the coach that may have been largely motivated by contractual reasons probably but nonetheless changes here and it really does signify a new era at the west coast eagles so nisbet obviously did a fantastic job you know we, we built a brand i say we built a brand of the west coast eagles um to being you know an absolute powerhouse on and off the field one of the most successful clubs in the AFL era and the strength of our brand obviously having over 100,000 members in those metrics you know as far as a CEO goes it's hard to do better than what we've done considering there has been adversity over the years and um, of course we're in a pit of adversity at the moment but a new era has begun we have a new CEO for the first time since I've been watching football I started watching the Eagles in about 2002 I reckon so Nisbet has literally been the CEO that entire time so I've never known anything different and I remember that weird feeling as well when uh, John Worth Worsfold stepped down as coach. I'd never known at that point uh, a coach other than John Worsfold uh, at the West Coast Eagles. And that kind of brings its own level of uncertainty. When the predecessor has been so successful, you obviously start to wonder, well, how well the next one will go. Which is not to say that change was not needed. I think, um, you know, from a Worsfold point of view, you know, I think he was pretty burnt out. And Nisbet has been around for a while and he's not a young man. So the good thing about this Pike appointment is that um, from a you know, sentimental point of view, he is um, Eagles, maybe a legend, but he's a Hall of Famer. He's a premiership player for the West Coast Eagles, obviously bleeds blue and gold. But not only that, is he not only a, he's a West Coast Eagles person, but he also presents something to us right now, which I think will prove to be quite valuable. And that is a fresh set of eyes because he has been away from the club for a serious amount of time now. So he's got a pretty interesting uh, resume. Um, he's, he's worked for 15 years in business leadership, apparently in the oil and gas sector. In addition to that, he has also been a coach of an AFL club in the Adelaide Crows, took them to a grand final. More recently, has been at the Sydney Swans in a uh, in a coaching capacity. Both of those clubs have seen grand finals in that time. He was also an assistant coach under Adam Simpson in 2015 when we made the grand final that year as well. So this success seems to follow this guy. Now, whether or not that is because Don Pike, you know, is King Midas and everything he touches turns to gold, it's not so much that, but it does help that he has been involved in successful programs. Not only that, he's also been there when shit has hit the fan, uh, particularly from an on-field perspective. So we obviously know his time in Adelaide didn't 
end particularly well. There was a lot of controversy over that preseason camp where the club at, at the Crows seemed to implode a little bit. But, you know, I wouldn't fixate too much on the negative there. Obviously, it seemed like a pretty bad mistake, that community camp. At the very least, I kind of see that as somebody who's learned from something, gone through some adversity at a club, and has equally seen both sides of what can go right at a football club, and, and just as importantly, what is happening when things are going really poorly. So from a football point of view, he's, he brings experience, you know, from a coaching point of view, uh, you know, his role at West Coast isn't going to be about that. It's gonna be more so about his business acumen, but also his leadership style. And like I said, it bodes well that he's been involved in successful programs and, you know, potentially made a few mistakes, learn from them and see what it takes to be the best. Because the Sydney Swans, they're a strong, successful brand, as are the Adelaide Crows, and historically, so have the West Coast Eagles. But like I said, it's not gonna be a football role as such. Um, so it does, it's gonna require some business acumen, but he used to be, he used to be on the Eagles board for a start. He's uh, started and run two successful oil and gas companies, apparently. And uh, he's quoted as saying it's helped him, you know, manage people, which is gonna be a huge part of his job, negotiating contracts, building brands, all of those things. So uh, as far as a resume goes, you can't get much more well-rounded than what we've got here with Don Pike. But as I said, he comes at a precarious point for the West Coast Eagles. Um, I'm as optimistic as any Eagles fan about, you know, the fact that we're going to get through this horrible period and uh, that, you know, is certainly for the AFL men's and the, um, you know, the waffle competition. I think if you simply take out the horrific run of injuries over the last two years, we kind of settle as just being a bad rebuilding team. We don't look as horrific as we currently do look. As for the AFLW competition, we all know that, you know, we weren't one of the initial teams, things aren't going so well on field, but it's kind of so early in the AFLW kind of scheme of things that give it time and this league is going to look very, very different in five to 10 years and for accumulating high draft picks and the, and the young female, you know, football programs that are out there continue to be strong, then in time, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. I'm not too concerned about the, the poor AFLW performance. So it's going to be a weird passion project for Don Pike coming to the club that, you know, presumably he loves uh, at a point where the AFL side has won five games in two years. The AFLW side has won f uh, five games in three years. It's a rebuild in every sense of the word, really. And uh, he is quoted as saying his first priority is establishing the on-field performance to get back what it used to be because everything trickles down from there. It's probably hard to be really successful commercially if, uh, if your team's absolute dog shit. So... I'm relieved that we've probably got one of the best and most appropriate people for this particular role that we could have uh, from canvassing the market. Give it 12 months, Don, Don Park could have been somewhere else. So hopefully this change marks the dawn of a new era. And um, you know, from an optimistic point of view, I'd like to think that in 12 months time, we're not talking about a new coach because I want Adam S Simpson to have succeeded. He does talk about um, you know probably not really getting involved in football stuff, despite obviously his extensive experience. That makes sense. It's not his responsibility. His responsibility is to just make sure everything is functioning well and he's putting the right people in place. So he's going to probably take the first year to be to be learning. Um, you know, as for the draft itself, I, I can't imagine he's going to have too much impact on the decision. You know, I have said in the past, you know, this this decision around pick one that the West Coast Eagles currently face. It's, uh, it's broader than just on-field, you know, decisions being made. It's kind of also about branding. You know, West Coast poster boy for the last um, 15 years and Nick Nat Nui, or one of the poster boys, has just retired. We need a new number nine. Um, and I've made the point previously that I can see why the Eagles would want to draft the most marketable player in this year's draft. That being said, I have also said more recently that I'm starting to think we're going to trade the pick. I am an emotional fan and, and I think about this a lot and my mind keeps changing, but logically that argument makes sense. On the topic of pick one, you know, there has been over the recent weeks, you know, a little bit of talk about trades potentially being done. And like I said, in recent times, I kind of suggested I thought the Eagles would I, I still think the Eagles' best case scenario here is making a trade for pick one that is better than having pick one. It's just that perhaps now, from what we've learned about the threshold at which the Eagles are willing to trade the pick, it's perhaps higher than we thought it was, and probably more so it's higher than other clubs thought it would be. So what I mean by that is, you know, West Coast probably have their, their price, their internal price, and uh, I'd imagine what is being offered by North Melbourne, Hawthorne, and the Melbourne Football Club as well has, you know, been well and truly under the threshold. And it seems now by reports, North, Melbourne, these teams are starting to back out a little bit because they are realizing how much West Coast are actually going to ask to trade over pick one. So we know that, you know, the Eagles have asked for two and three uh, from North Melbourne. We know North Melbourne are not particularly interested 
in handing that deal over and I would understand why because I also think two and three would be better than having pick one. So again, that would be, you know, North Melbourne's prerogative to to look at it from a marketing point of view and getting Harley Reid would be beneficial for them too. But it's probably not going to be enough for them to trade picks two and three for pick one. If there was some sort of way that two and uh, maybe six from Melbourne, so North Melbourne's two, if they then traded for pick six from Melbourne, two and six, for me personally, I think that is still above the threshold and very, very doable from, from our point of view. It's still a steep price to pay. I don't think North Melbourne would be super willing to do it. And of course, you know, that would rely on Melbourne uh, being willing to trade pick six in a scenario where they don't even get pick one. So they're probably unwilling to help North Melbourne out to try and get pick one. I've talked a little bit about how I thought Geelong might be willing to split their um, pick eight. I think it currently is for two later first rounders from North Melbourne. I think it was reported somewhere that was rejected as well. So if that doesn't happen, then it's hard to just see how a, a deal gets done unless North Melbourne really are bluffing and they throw a Hail, Hail Mary um, when the clock starts on West Coast first selection in 2023 draft. So as it stands, it's probably going to be Harley Reid. But again, watch me make a video in a week when we see an article about West Coast considering trading pick one. Who knows? There's a lot of conjecture around this time of year. So yeah, we'll see what happens. In other list management news though, we, uh, we have made some contract calls on three rookies and I'm happy about them all. So Zane True, who um, played... He certainly played in that win against the Bulldogs. He kicked one of the winning goals, um, has been extended for another year on the rookie list. Now, my understanding of this situation is West Coast tried to get Devin Robertson. Failing that, they decided not to um, either delist or re-sign Zane True. Now that Robertson's staying at the Brisbane Lions, Zane True uh, has been granted another year on the, on the list. So the connection between those two players is that they're both relatively developed inside mids. Obviously, Devin Robinson more so. He's got more AFL experience. But Zane True's done a few years on the rookie list now and really took a big step up in terms of production. I, mean, I think last year, he averaged about 15 touches a game. That shot up to about 25 and a half this year in the waffle. So from an output point of view, you know, it was always going to take him a little bit longer to develop as an inside mid. He's physically maturing and we're starting to see more output there. And you know, from what I've seen at AFL level, there's some AFL traits there. Is he going to be a potential top liner? He'd need to improve a lot, but I'm happy with this move. We've also re-signed or extended um, two Cat B rookies in Tyrell Dewar and Jordan Baker, two players that most Eagles fans, if you're a pretty casual fan, would never have heard of, but they're two players that we got through our Next Generation Academy in 2022. So the thing about Dua and Baker, particularly Dua, is that they were drafted pretty not ready for waffle level seniors because they are such raw talents. They obviously went undrafted and we signed them directly through um, our Cat B list. So Tyrell Dua actually put together a pretty good season in uh, his debut season in the waffle, you know, playing as a medium small four in a team that's got belted every week. He really grew as the year went on. And he was always going to be a long-term prospect with, you know, he was always going to be a speculative one. He played a little bit on the wing, if I'm not mistaken. And towards the back end of the year, he had one game where he had 20 touches and a goal. So from, to go from not being ready for Waffle Seniors to finishing the year playing a little bit higher up the ground, getting 20 touches and kicking a goal, what more could you really ask from a prospect like that in terms of development in one season? So... I'm glad to see that he's extended for another year. Jordan Baker, similarly, uh, he played about 13 games this year in the Waffle Seniors competition. And, and you know what? Played pretty well. Averaged about 16 disposals and four and a half marks a game. So those three players that we've re-signed, I think I would argue in terms of how much they've improved and were developed in the time that they've been at the club is fairly significant and worthy of a contract extension. So as it currently stands, we are likely to take four or five picks in this year's draft. We can hold over a list spot if we don't think that fifth pick is worth taking and then we can hold a spot for the mid-season draft. Although, you know, the way the last few seasons have gone, we're probably going to have a long-term injury, which would then allow us to open up a mid-season rookie spot anyway. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully there is someone that catches our eye. Hopefully we pull up another Noah Long uh, late in this year's draft. But... That is uh, all I've got for you for right now From in terms of West Coast Eagles news. We've still got some time. Um, you know, trades can happen until November 10th in terms of picks. So there is a chance that there's a deal done before, you know, six days from now, five days from now, whatever. Then, you know, once the clock starts on the draft, of course, there can be live trading as well. So plenty of more of this to look out for. But as we get closer to the draft, look out for more draft content and, you know, some Eagles-focused stuff as well. I'll probably do another Eagles draft preview. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Go the Eagles. Cheers.